Okay, so as I mentioned before, this was my solution to the problem before I worked it some more. So this might be considered a, a first draft that's digital. Then I was thinking some more and did something like this. This was way too far, but out of doing this two steps back, I came up with the idea of replacing the O's, and this would be the final, um, the ultimate solution to my design problem for this word, for expressing the word cooking, its spirit and its meaning through typography. So let's walk through how this started. So I'm going to show you some visual research. Um, there's a lot of visual research I have here, um, and let me share with you the images that I used so you understand my thinking. Guys, we hire thinkers and doers, not just doers. The thing I'm seeing in some of our situations with portfolio, not all students, but every semester I have at least one student who thinks that you can just grab random elements that don't mean anything and have no thought to what those elements are, place them together in a layout and say you're a graphic designer. Absolutely not. Everything we do has to have a reason and a good reason based off of good sound research and uh, how well things resonate with the content. So I started researching eggs. I was like, you know, I want my type to have fried edges. Now that's going to be a pretty tall order, right? I thought, you know, for this project, this might be a little too much. So I started researching eggs. And I, want, I would basically take the edges of these fried eggs and try to duplicate them in um, Illustrator or InDesign or a combination of the two. So this is my illustration, or these are my, uh, these are photos, I didn't take them, photos I found on the internet of fried eggs. So my thinking is, that is for another day. <laughs> but I found this. Yes. I was like, oh, now that's a simplified form that I can deal with. In the limited time, and here's what you guys have to do, as professionals even, in the limited time I have possible for me to create a fabulous solution to a problem and do it quickly, I have to discern which elements graphically may take me less time, but yet effectively communicate. So we have to constantly analyze uh, our, our thinking. So this is about another project. It's not about today but this is. So, how did I get from here to here? And if we'll zoom in to this, you'll see that this is fairly well manufactured and accurate to this image, um, if I hit preview. So, so what I do, uh, when I, I do find very simplified elements that are photographic. Okay, I do not find illustrated graphics. None of these are illustrated. These are all photographic. The reason why I don't use illustrated graphics is because I'm creating custom, one-of-a-kind solutions to design problems. I am not providing cookie cutter. I am not providing clip art or using clip art. It has its place, folks, but not in your portfolio. Anybody can use clip, clip art. In your portfolio, it should be one-of-a-kind solutions to problems. So that's why I used a photograph. And I, do you guys, did I discuss, we talked about Shepherd Fairy, did we not? Yes. Yeah, this is Shepherd Fairy, the guy who did the Hope Obama thing. This is kind of similar to maybe what a Shepherd Fairy might do. Find some photos that you don't necessarily have to have taken yourself and work them to your advantage. Okay, so let me show you the illustrator portion of this. I'm going to show you what this file looks like after I worked it in Illustrator. And Illustrator for some reason wasn't open. It should have been, but it's reopening. Um, I want to share with you the magic of Image Trace. How many of you guys have used Image Trace before in Illustrator? Yeah, it's pretty cool stuff. But I have to warn you, you have to be careful about how you use it because it can look as if you are just button pushing and not putting in any of your hand nor mind into your work. So I'm going to show you how to handle some of this stuff. It is not always easy, and it shouldn't be. If it were easy, everybody would choose graphics as a profession, whether it's web design or photo or whatever. So I'm going to share with you uh, some tips on this. Okay, it's taking its time. 
Sorry, I thought it was already open, but it showed it was earlier. Okay, <coughs> pardon me. So I'm going to create a new document. And it doesn't matter if it's a 10 by 10 document or what it is. So actually, you know what? I'm going to go layers. This is already open. And I'm just going to turn this layer off. And I'll create a new one. Now, for those of you guys who are not familiar with layers, um, it's a fabulous, it's just fabulous stuff. Layers helps you organize different graphics in different, um, kind of like folders, and you can turn them off and on and, and work them pretty easily. Now, when you're in Illustrator and you want to put an image in here to image trace it, you'll go to File and Place. Now I have to go find that graphic, and for me it's going to be in my Project 5 folder. I keep things fairly organized, and I'm going to click on the uh, element for the uh, electric range, and I just click. I don't click and drag, I just click, and it puts it in there. Okay, now I'm actually going to minimize my layers for just a second because we're really going to, to be talking about image trace right now. Now the cool thing about Illustrator, it doesn't matter what size I'm working in here because this is vector. So if my stuff is kind of small, no problem. If my stuff is big, no problem. I can resize it without any pixelization after I've created a vector thing. Okay, so how do I image trace this? Well, there is an image trace button, but I suggest highly you do not just be a button pusher. So if I just hit image trace, we can see that mm, that doesn't look nearly as nice as what I have in my uh, original file here, the, the file I created. That looks horrible. Okay, so do not get into the habit of being a button pusher. Chickens can be trained to play a piano. You ever seen that? Especially in Mexico. You give, you put, a, it's like a vending machine. You put a quarter in there and the chicken wakes up and music starts, you know, little background music starts to play and, and, and he pecks a tune and then he gets food. And he does it right every time. Okay, you guys aren't chickens. You're humans. So I'm not going to be talking about button pushing. I'm going to show you how to think through a tool and work through a tool. It, it, it involves some critical thinking. A chicken cannot do this. So I'm going to undo this image trace. I suppose we can go to the fly out menu off to the right of image trace and we might go, oh, let's see what one of these does. Oh, let's do a black and white logo. Well, that still looks pretty bad. I want to control this. I don't want to let the computer make choices for me. I just hit Command Z to undo that. What you want to do is you want to get custom options here. But when you choose or when you click on this little triangle, custom is grayed out. Oh, I hate that when they do that. They put something in there and then you can't use it because it's grayed out. Oh, no, you do want the image selected, by the way. Otherwise, nothing's going to happen. It's a select then effect environment. So I have to go to Window, and I have to find the Image Trace option, which is going to bring up this little dialog box, or a tool. It's not really a dialog box. It's a palette. So um, the cool thing about this is there's a preview button. Now, I will tell you, it's kind of weird. The preview button in this Creative Cloud version is the same thing as actually having it traced. You'll notice when I click preview, the trace now is gray. So it's kind of weird. Now again, this is not what I want. The beauty of image trace when you know how to do it well is you, you actually use the advanced features. So where it says threshold and, and where it says advanced, you can click on the arrow and you can start to adjust what you want to keep and what you want to go away by adjusting threshold Okay, angles of curves and the path precision. And I don't know what to tell you as far as which settings to use because each thing is different. You just have to do stuff and see if it works. And it's not going to be perfect, folks. But we can go in and fix it. Okay, it, there is no image tracing that pre provides perfect results. Uh, I'll tell you that right now. Ooh, oh, oh, paths low is bad on this one. Ooh, there we go. So I get it. Oh, whoa, <laughs> threshold high is horrible. Oh, <laughs> oh, I'm on fire. Look, I'm Satan right there. Okay, that's bad. Okay, now that looks pretty good, right? 
That looks pretty good. Yeah, Not perfect, but good. Yeah. So I just closed this image trace because it's actually going to trace it. It's already traced. Preview and trace are the same thing. Now, it is not perfect, so I now have to put more of my hand and mind into my work, creating custom one-of-a-kind graphics, okay? So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to expand this. Now, what expanding does is it allows me to edit anchor points and pull and move things and delete things and, and tweak it. Now, when I expand this, before I get too carried away here, when you expand an object, it creates a lot more uh, information than what you need. One thing it creates is a big white background, square, square parts. So I'm going to hit the expand button. Of course, this has to be selected. Up here is the expand button. And if it's not selected, the expand button will not be showing. So if I click somewhere else, see, no expand button. This has to be selected. And you'll see now it has converted it into vector paths. These are those red lines. Now, the reason why they're red is because my layer right now is a red layer. If we went to Layers panel, um, you can see my layer 2 has red right there. A default layer will be a blue outline, okay? So um, every time I create a layer, it makes it a different outline, okay? So if I create, and how to make a new layer is you click on the new layer button right here, and I don't know if you noticed, but I, I as all, since all the select is selected, it's on layer two, and layer two may have something already that I want to work with, I can move selections from one layer to another when something's selected, and you'll see a little um, indicator. It says it indicates the selected artwork is on this layer. You can grab that little color box and move it to another layer, and now I can turn off layer two, keep leave that alone, and layer three might be the layer I want to work on. Okay, so knowing about how to manipulate layers is really, really important. Um, you don't have to copy and paste from one layer to another, and a lot of people don't realize in Illustrator all it's about is moving, uh, cl clicking on something, and then moving its little tiny indicator to another layer. Okay, I'm going to leave it on red because you can probably see that better. All right, now, after I expanded this, there are things I do not want. I said there was going to be this big white box. Your direct selection tool, which is the white arrow tool, is absolutely an uh, important tool in you being able to function here. So this is called the direct selection tool. You will hear me reference as the white arrow tool um, slash direct selection tool because we are visual. So if I click on the direct selection tool, the white arrow, I, anything I click and come in contact with, I'll click outside the object and I'll click and drag over parts. So you'll notice I'm not going to click on this square. I'm going to click outside the square and grab part of the square. Now I'm going to hit the delete key once and it's still got parts it needs to delete. So I hit the delete key twice. It now has deleted that big white box that I don't need. And if I'm in InDesign, that big white box is going to give me some problems. I don't need extra information. Other information that it has that I don't need is this little triangle right here. So you'll notice I click out on the white area and I drag over it and I hit delete. Maybe once, uh, maybe twice. Depends on if I got all the nodes. Okay. Everything else I'm pretty satisfied with. But I will tell you that when... I'm going to turn uh, scrubby. Ugh, I hate scrubby zoom. Ooh, hate it. Ugh. Can't turn it off. Okay. Um... I will tell you though that it does put traces on top of traces on top of traces. That's that's the problem I run into all the time in, in Illustrator. Um, it, it, when it expands things, it expands maybe a little bit more than what we wanted to. So I'm going to grab my white arrow tool. I'm going to make sure nothing's selected. And I'm going to click dead in the center of something. I'm going to move it out. I'm like, okay, is there anything else in there? Oh, look, there's that. Oh, Yeah, you see that? Oh, wait, what's this? Oh, all that. Okay, okay. Oh, I see. It's tracing something. Okay. Yeah, wow, that's kind of funky. But I'm going to go in there. I'm, I'm going to hit Command-Z because I need that center part to be where it needs to go. But I'm going to go in here. I'm going to click on areas with the, again, I'm with the direct selection tool. Click on areas that I don't want. Now, if you click on a path, it's going to grab just an anchor point, and that's okay. I just have to delete, hit the delete key once, twice. Okay, gone. If you click in the middle of a solid colored object, it grabs a whole thing, and all you have to do is hit delete one time. Okay, so I'm getting rid of extraneous shapes that I do not need. Now I'm going to click over here 
Again, I'm going to click right in the middle of something. I'm like, oh, oops, <laughs> that didn't work out. Sometimes we should zoom in. Deselect, click right in the middle of something, move it. I'm like, oh, look, I don't need that. There's one right there. I'll delete it. Now, sometimes that's a solid color. Uh, if that's the case, then maybe leave it. In other words, that's white. Let me draw a box just so you can see what I mean by a solid color. I'm going to send this box to the back after I fill it with a color, and we'll see, do we need that little white shape? Let me send this to the back. No, we don't, because that's still white there. So I'm going to delete that path. No, let me click on this little white part. Well, what's that? Oh my gosh, I didn't even need that. Oh, that's some big white thing. Wow, you see how it wants to do a bunch of, th oh, I'm like, wow, that's, oh, oops, there, I needed that. Ah, oh, darn it. Now that's show through. <coughs> if you wanted that to stay white, I'm going to hit Control or Command Z a couple times. Ooh, let's put him back. And I'm going to, <coughs> pardon me, folks, I'm still getting over this thing Alan Lewis gave to me. Yeah, and that's recorded. <laughs> Oops, I'm still going to get him into place. I'm going to draw, redraw the red box so you guys can see what I'm doing. So it's not, see how the tool is not as simple as just hitting a button and then just going about, you know, your business. Um, so we knew that this was a good guy. So what I do is I click on him and I will go to object and I will hide him for just a second. I, I still want him, but he's hidden. I'm like, okay, what's this business here? That thing's huge and I don't need it. Delete it. Okay, now I'm going to go to object and show all, and now my little highlights are back. Okay, so you can hi Oh, crap. Uh-oh. Oh, now that's a problem. See, this is what I do all the time, all day long. Oh, I did the wrong thing. I needed that thing because this path is opened and I needed him back. So uh, undo that. Sometimes we don't know. It's like, oh, darn it. Uh, undo show all, undo clear, undo move. And I'm like, oh, I should have been a little bit more careful. Let's see what that's about. Hmm. Well, no. Okay, I'll delete it. That's weird. Sorry, guys, I'm a little confused. I think because when the path is open, it really messes with your mind. So, and you'll understand what I mean when you get a little bit more involved in, in, in design. If you have open paths, it really screws with your head. Where'd he go? Hide him. We really do not need the one that's behind him. Oops. Where, I must have, did I delete it? He must be gone. No, he's not. He's still there. There we go. So I'm just basically cleaning out any uh, unneeded graphics. Okay. There's probably more of those. They're just kind of hiding. Now, and you can't always see them when you uh, do, there's a special view, it's called the uh, preview view. I go to view and outline and there's view and preview. Um, the view outline kind of shows me uh, what the actual shape looks like without fill. Uh, sometimes you can see things in this view that you can't see otherwise. But I sometimes will toggle between uh, the preview and the linear view. Okay, now let's talk about polishing this thing up. We have a couple of areas right in here. Oh, there's a little gray guy there. I don't know what he's doing. There's some really crazy stuff that's gone on here. But we're going to just clean this area up. Um, the tools that I use uh, oftentimes are, one, the direct selection tool, and two, the pen tool. But if you click on the pen tool, this is called a Bezier pen tool. Bezier is spelled B-E-Z-I-E-R. It's French. Uh, the Bezier pen tool, it has a delete anchor point, an add anchor point, and also you can convert a corner anchor point to a curve or vice versa. So I just tore that off. Now to add an anchor point, I hit the plus sign uh, and it will go to that tool. If I want to delete an anchor point, I go to the minus sign and it will delete that tool or that anchor point. If I need the direct selection tool, I hit the A and I can get to that. So these are keyboard shortcuts if you, instead of having to go over here all the time and go, oh gosh, let me grab something and move it. You can uh, quickly, I'll hit the minus tool, minus key on the key on the keyboard, and this tool will highlight. So I'm hitting minus. Oh look, there's that tool. Awesome. Oh, if you can't remember that, just use it normally. Um, 
So I have to toggle back and forth between certain tools, so that's how I do that. Now in this area here, we can see that's kind of wonky. I hit the minus and I got rid of that. This area here, I don't care for him. I clicked on him, he's gone. This area here, don't like him. Oops, what's going on there? I don't know. Let's, oh, and you always get this. It's nice to zoom in. It's saying I didn't hit an anchor point. So I'm going to try to hit an anchor point. There we go. That's gone. That's gone. This one's gone. Ah, I missed it. If you don't like that, hit don't show again. And delete those things that you don't need. And if it doesn't delete it, it means you're not hitting it. So zoom in. Oh, I see. This is... This is a handle. I don't want to delete that. That's a handle that went like that. It went a little crazy. That is something you move with the white arrow tool, the direct selection tool. Okay, so I get things a little bit nicer. Now there's another tool here <coughs> I'd like to share with you, and that is the smooth path tool. Uh, sometimes these come in pretty janky looking and I want to smooth them out. So I'm going to get my uh, direct selection tool and I'm going to grab everything. I'm going to try to smooth out some of these areas that are a little rough. So I'm grabbing the whole thing. And this might also eliminate some of these anchor points which you don't need lots and lots of anchor points. If you got a gazillion of these little dots, that's a big problem. It will take forever for that thing to print. Each of these dots has an X and Y mathematical geometrical a geometric coordinate. Okay, so if I were to highlight one of these little guys, it will tell me that the x-axis is at 5 point such and such an inch by 2. This is exactly the position on the page. When I move it, it shows me, it shows me there, oh, now it's, that, that's the position on the document. Each anchor point is mathematics that the RIP, the raster image processor that's inside the printer, it has to do all that math. If I had a bazillion and one anchor points, which I don't, I've got plenty, but I don't have a gazillion of them. Uh, but if I had a bazillion and one anchor points, this would take forever to print. And nothing aggravates a fellow student like waiting for their stuff to come out, and 10 minutes later they're still waiting because your stuff had a million anchor points on it, and even though it looks good, it's not technically correct, and they're waiting for your stuff because you have a million anchor points and that has to mathematically calculate each one to be able to print this image. So this is where it's mathematics, it's not pixels. So I'm going to simplify this just a smidge and see if I can get rid of some of these anchor points that I don't need and it'll maybe smooth it out. So I selected everything with the white direct selection tool, the white arrow, and I go to Object, Path, and I go to simplify. Now there's a preview on this, thank goodness. Okay, a simplify dialog box will come up. I can preview it. Oh, holy cow, we don't want that. This is a, the oh. default. Yeah, so I'm gonna take the curve precision up a little higher. Okay, now it's like, oh, that's better. I'm gonna uncheck preview and check it back on. If it's adding anchor points, I have to be really careful. Like, oh, I don't want to add anchor points. I'm going to do the angle, angle threshold a little higher. Okay, there we go. Ah, better. Oops, no. Ah. You know, it's a hot mess sometimes. You just got to clean it up. And it's all about, you know, what, what you're, what's uh, my eye. And you, technically, you can show the original, but you're like, oh, okay, I can see where it's cleaned up. I don't typically use that. I do it by eye. Does this look good or not? And if you do straight lines and click on that, this is what you get. Oh, wow. How 1960s. How cool. Nope. That's not at all what I wanted. So I sit there and I finesse these until, uh, oh, I'm like, oh, what do I like? And I get it to the point where I, I like what it, it's doing. And then I hit OK. So I cleaned it up a little bit. Now, again, this is not a perfect science. It takes a human being to make things perfect. Well, look better. Yeah. Thank you. We can't make things perfect. Um, so I have to go in there with this white arrow tool known as the direct selection tool and you see how wonky that thing looks as compared to that thing and I'm going to zoom way in. I always zoom way in when I'm dealing with Illustrator anchor points and I'm like I don't even know what's going on there with that loop-de-loop. -loop. Let me pull that out. What is going on? Ooh. 
Yeah, if you get these really weird loop-de-loops, that's really unprofessional. You see anything like that? Crisscrossing? No. It will, give, it will give you problems, it will give your printer problems, and it's very, very unprofessional. So I'm going to go in there, I'm going to go, what is going on with that? I click on just that anchor point. Now, if it's grabbing the whole thing and you're trying to, you know, you're like, I want to move that, and it's moving the whole thing, ah just click and drag over that anchor point. Or sometimes you can click on the shift key, click on the anchor point, let off the shift key, and click on the anchor point again, and it grabs just that anchor point. I particularly like to just click and drag over the anchor point. That's easier than shift, click, and then off, shift, click again. So I'm clicking on the anchor point, I'm pulling it out. I'm like, what is going on with this thing? This is crazy. Oh my goodness, I'm clicking on it again. I'm like, wow, look at all these crazy things going on. Ooh. So I'm like, okay, this anchor point, oh look, there's another thing back there. Oh, there's the ghost. <laughs> See, I told you it gives you extra sometimes. Let's get rid of that. Get rid of that extra image it did. Um, right here, I'm like, he, he seems right, but this guy doesn't seem right. So I'm going to move him. And you will see, and if I zoom in, these anchor points don't get any bigger, I'm sorry to say. Oh, wait, did they change that? Nah, they don't get any bigger. But this is what is called a handle. That, moving that adjusts the curvature of the line, okay? You can either have a curved line or more of a straight line, depending on how, where you put the, can, the handle, you either make it more obtuse or more acute. Uh, that's a geometric term. And you can move things around. I'm going to make this kind of curved a little bit. Whoa, not you. Bring this up. So I'm just kind of making this, I'm going to make this contour a little bit, the circular shape that's underneath it. This, uh, well, it was circular on my other piece. Maybe in this case, I won't make it circular. I'll make it straight. My other piece that I did earlier, you can never, it's, it's hard to live trace exactly the same way each time unless you write down all the numbers that you did. So that's straight. I'm like, well, if that's straight, then I can probably afford to delete that anchor point. So get the delete anchor point tool and just go, eh, there we go, very straight. And sometimes I'll even do this. I'm like, you know, why do all that work again? This little figure here, this little shape here is probably going to be identical to that. So again, I get my direct selection tool. I'll click and drag over this entire shape, hit the delete key, and I'll grab the one that I already drew, and I alt and shift drag it. Alt copies, shift keeps it in line, and I'll bring it over here. Like, why draw that thing twice? I don't want to. And again, I can go in here. Oh, Lord. Here's another loop-de-loop. -loop. I'm not sure why Image Trace is doing that today here in this classroom, but there's another loop. So I can click on that anchor point, maybe move it over. Ooh, I got some straightening up to do here. I just start moving things, straighten them up. Oops. Again, if it grabs your whole object, you got to get isolate the anchor point, and you just sit there and you modify. Now, many of you guys will be doing this on typography as well, and I'm going to show you that in InDesign. Okay, so let's pretend this is good. It's not, but let's pretend it's good. I can copy and paste from Illustrator to InDesign this shape. It understands this. There are some things in Illustrator uh, that we can do that InDesign doesn't understand, but it definitely understands shape. So I can select all of this. I can hit Command A to select it or click and drag it over it with the uh, uh, item tool, the selection tool, which is the black arrow tool. I'm going to select it all. I typically will do my cleanup here, but you could do it in, Illustra in InDesign as well. They're very similar. I'm going to go to Edit and Copy. And then I'm going to open my InDesign. And guys, even though the first drafts I mentioned is half size, go ahead and make your document size 10 by 10. That's the, is, is this project 10 by 10? Okay, so I'm going to create a new document, and I'm going to tell, turn facing pages off, because this is not a book, and I'm typing 10 IN, don't forget the IN, otherwise it thinks it's PICAS. 10 PICAS is only uh, an inch and two PICAS. 10 inch by 10 inch, 10 IN. I'm not so worried about, you know, columns. Uh, margins are nice, though. 
margins are the little purple line. The purple line is not the edge of the page. That's just a nice safety margin. The edge of the page is the black line where the gray meets. And I'm going to go to now file, or excuse me, edit and paste, or command V is what I use. And you will see it will paste that graphic into InDesign. It's still editable. Now, in InDesign, you have a layers panel. It looks identical, the little icon, to the one in Illustrator. So I'm going to click on my layers panel, <coughs> and you can rename this layer. I double click on it, and here comes the dialog box, and I'm going to call this burner. And I say, okay, thank you, you're the burner layer. Now I'm not going to lock this layer yet because I need to maybe work on it, maybe resize it, do some things. Um, again, this is still editable. If I wanted to edit something, it's the same tool. Here I'm in InDesign. I use the white arrow tool, known as the direct selection tool, to click on nodes and move them, okay, or drag them around. Maybe I want to elongate that. I use the pen tool and its constituents. Now, unfortunately, it's not exactly the same keyboard shortcuts, though, in InDesign. The delete anchor point is still the minus tool, but the add an anchor point is not the plus sign, it's the equal sign. That's kind of bites. Not the same, not the same keyboard shortcuts. And the direct selection tool is still hitting the A to get the it. Okay, so the only thing that changes in our keyboard shortcuts is that the plus anchor point, which I haven't even talked about adding the anchor point, we haven't had to here, is now an equal sign. <coughs> Now, there are some wonky things going on here. These highlights here really are not very attractive. And I've got loop-de-loops going on. So I can go in with my white arrow tool, known as my direct selection tool, and I can click on those highlights. And I might just, I don't want this to punch through. That doesn't even need to be a highlight. So maybe I just go ahead and fill that with black. Now, how do I fill it with black? I'm going to go to my swatches panel. There's a swatches panel here. I could have done this in Illustrator or in Design, uh, but and then both have a swatches panel. So I'm like, I'm going to fill you with black because you don't need to be there. I need to kill some of this loop-de-loop -loop business. Boy, that image trace I did was kind of lousy. I should have looked a little closer because I don't like loops. I could have controlled that. Now I have to go clean a bunch of stuff up. I, I can't stand that. But what I did. Should have been a little bit more cognizant of what I was doing. Like, where is this loop business happening? Holy moly. Yikes. Lord, ugh, where is this? Oh, there it is. Okay, what is going on? Oh, if I move this over here, that's okay, and I do that. Sometimes you're like, gosh, I can't even figure this out. And so I'll, I'll just click on something and move it drastically and figure out what in the world is happening. Then I can maybe modify my anchor points and make things right. That, that was crazy loop. Here's another one. Oh no, loops. Shoot, you know, for the time it takes me to clean this up, I might just go back and image trace it again. You with me? Yeah. Maybe do it right the first time, not knowing I was doing it wrong this time. I'm like, holy cow, what is all this looping business? Looping is not professional. Yikes. Oh, oh lord. This is just a hot mess, folks. Phew. So at this point, I might actually re-image trace this in Illustrator, uh, looking at it much closer, uh, to look at my result much closer so I can get rid of these loops. So for now, we'll, we'll assume I did that. Ugh. But if you got these other parts like this, I'm going to fill him with black as well. Like, oh, that little guy right there? Mm, let's fill him with black because I don't need those that with black as well. So I'm cleaning this up. <clears throat> now you guys all know my demonstrations are a little quick and dirty. If I'm doing them without having to talk through them, you can see that the end result on my other one was a little nicer. And oh, I'm looking at this going, what is that loop? Grab my white arrow tool, click and drag over it. That's not even, I'm not even using that. Delete, delete. He's gone. He was some extra shape. So the image trace is not always funnest thing. Okay, so I clean this up. Now I am going to grab all this, and it is grouped, cool thing. 
I didn't, you know, if I if I were to just click on anything and move it with the black arrow tool, with the selection tool, or the move tool, it, it does move the whole thing. However, if you were to click on something with a white arrow tool, it may only move a part of that thing. <coughs> so be careful, be real cognizant of which tool you're on. Black arrow tool moves the whole thing. White arrow tool grabs portions of things, assuming the whole thing is not selected. Okay. Now, it, it's pretty self-explanatory what I did as far as making this into a G, or no, into O's. Um, basically, just like typography, if I held down Shift and Command, and I clicked, and I waited, and I start dragging, we can see that we can reduce or enlarge the size of an element. This is the same keyboard shortcut we use with typography. And if I want to rotate this, I put it, my cursor down on a corner. If I hold down the shift key, it will rotate perfectly in 45s or 90 degree angles. And I need to copy and paste this and put it next to itself. Now the reason why on my solution, that was alt, click and drag and hold down the shift key, it'll stay in line. The reason why in my solution that I did um, on my original document, that I used a small and a larger the reason why that happened was because of this. When on a burner, you have that one little burn in the back, you know, that almost worthless one. But, um, you know, if you're boiling just a spot of, little spot of water or you're boiling one egg, you might use that. But I thought the variation worked better than not having variation. So if I were to use this one and hide these... <coughs> It was okay, oops, I forgot the center part, but I, I thought the variation kind of gave it a little bit more authenticity, so that's why I did that. I'm going to tell it to show all. And you may argue, no, I don't like that, I like the two together, you know, that's, that's debatable in a critique. And then we'd maybe take a, we'd be democratic about it, take a vote and figure out how many people like the two the same size and how many like the different size. Okay. So basically what I did is I held down shift and command and I clicked and draw, whoops, I'm an illustrator, let me get it in this. I, I held down shift and command and I clicked and dragged down to make this smaller. And then I just flipped it the other way using, there's little rotators right here. And I connected them. I did have to, I did get rid of, I believe, with the white arrow tool, because it affects these little guys, I got rid of these two um, extra lines. I think I shortened them here, and I put these two together. Now, when I put them together, I had to modify the thickness of uh, these ending points so they match those. So that, that I did do. Um, and you know, you just want to be consistent. So I moved this guy right here is what I did. Moved him down. I didn't move him. I wanted this, and I had to widen both of them. So I just got these to kind of match up by widening them and moving them around. Okay. So this needs a little bit more work. My digital craft is not real good right now because these don't line up, but I would definitely have these things line up maybe widen some of the angles here. Okay, so it looks more authentic to uh, what you would expect to see. So take the time to deal with these details. You guys ever heard the phrase, the devil's in the details? What does that mean? Google it. What's the devil's in the details mean? If we it means it's hard to be perfect. Yep, but we want to try. <laughs> so if I hit the W key, you can see, uh, you know, the W key we know in InDesign is what you see is what you get. And I'm like, oh my gosh, still my digital craft is off. So let me pull this and get this to align a little bit better. So I'm going to get this to be perfect. And I know we can't be perfect. But yeah, actually, we can with the software. That's kind of cool. Kind of amazing. But I'm trying to get this to be these two to kind of come together a little night more nicely and I'm still off here gosh darn it 
this is why I zoom way in and sometimes turn my smart guides on. There we go. Done. Thank you. Yay. Okay. I might even just pull those all together and get rid of that little space there all together. Now we're going to deal with type. Now I'm going to highlight these with the black arrow tool. Come in contact with them. Oh, I forgot something. Again, the details. This highlight is here and that highlight's there. That is not possible in our in the environment we live in to have two light one light source do two different things like that. So what I will do is I will click with the white arrow tool this guy, make sure all of the anchor points are selected, meaning they're not hollow. See all these anchor points are selected. And I will uh, go in and let me zoom out. I'll just kind of rotate him around. So we got this rotation tool here, here. Okay, there we go. Oops, he went way out there. Well, let me get him back in place. Oh, it copied him too. Fabulous. Let's get rid of that. So now my little uh, reflecting points are at the same angle. And you're like, oh, well, Rebecca, if you're arguing that point, then could we, it's a, suffice to say that these little reflection points should also be on this side? Yes, you're right. But let's just, for the sake, time of, the time of sake, the sake of time, <laughs> um, let's just keep moving on. So I may group these together. So I click and drag on both of them. I do not click on one because if I do, it'll move it. I click outside of it. Anything it comes in contact with, I group it, which is Command G or Object Group. I already did it. That's why it's grayed out. Okay, so burner is set. I'm going to keep him in his own layer. Now I'm going to deal with some typography. New layer button. That's right by the little trash can. And I'm not going to necessarily name that right now. And I'm not going to lock what's on this layer because I'm going to need to move it around. Now's the fun part. I'm going to type in the word cooking. And what I did um, before was I had it um, as a, a very nice sans serif. You guys all know what I'm doing here. This shouldn't be a mystery. You know, me doing this stuff, making it bigger and smaller. No mystery, right? How do I get it to do this? Phew, small. Phew, big. How do I get it to do that? Command and shift, Command and, shift and click and drag. If I just do shift, it will stretch the box, the bounding box. If I just do command, we bastardize the typography. And that's a correct typographic term. It's not, we don't do this. We don't stretch the type. So both shift and command will give you proportional. Now, the typeface I used based off of my printouts from a previous, when I was doing it before I even started sketching, was, um, this is why you need to remember your typefaces, because uh, you get to this point, you're like, oh crap, what font did I use? Uh, for me, it was Century Gothic, and it is loaded. Oops, it disappeared. Well, that means that type is too big for that box. There we go. And I'm going to resize that a little bit. <clears throat> I probably need to resize my little do hickeys there. And we know we're replacing the O's. So sometimes what I'll do for a visual cue, I'm like, okay, which do I, O do I want to go with? Um, the small one, he's kind of inside the C, so I'm not going to worry about that. I'm going to go with the bigger O. So I actually put these together, and I watch to see when seems to be a good point to stop increasing the size of this. I'm looking for proportional here. I don't want my let, like, even though I'm replacing the O's, I have this beautiful G right here. It's exactly the same as an O. It just has a stick going down the side. So I need to make the size of these O's correlate with the size of, or match with the size of the uh, burners, okay, roughly. All right, now I am going to delete the O's and I'm going to get the C out of here too. The C, he was going to be his own thing. So I highlight the C and I hit Command X or Edit Cut. He's gone. Now I create another type box and I hit Command V or Edit Paste and it puts it in there. So he's, we're going to save him for later. Again, we know that double clicking on a corner node will tighten that up. And we, we do not want text boxes that are not tightened. I'm going to delete the two O's in cooking. And now I just have the word king. 
Okay, let me share with you a bit about kerning. Whoops. Kerning is the fine-tuned uh, adjustment of space between two characters, between letter pairs, not the whole word. That's tracking. I could drive a truck through the space between the N and the G. You guys see that? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, no problem. Here I come. <laughs> that same truck does not appear as if it would drive as well through the I and the N. And Well, I know we have this K kicking in, so yeah, technically the truck could jump jump this curb and get through that white space. But we're talking about here, you know, just bam, let me come right through there. So you need to kern these things. Um, there's easy kerning. Let the computer do it for you. That's fine, but it's not always accurate, but it's better than what they call metrics. If I triple click or double click on this word, you will see up here in the control panel for the character, make sure the A is selected not the P. Make sure the A is darkened. You will see a V and an A and a little line between them. And the word kerning in thousands of an M, it comes up. So we know that an M space or an M quad is about as wide as an uppercase M plus the white space around it in that particular font size. So thousands of the M are very small. Right now, by default, the kerning is set to metrics. Sucks. Not good. Now, that's okay for body copy. Nobody cares. It's so small, nobody cares about that. But headlines and subheadlines, page numbers, stuff like that, stuff that kind of stands alone, you've got to kern your stuff, folks. So, instead of metrics, I'm going to choose optical. Oh, now, does a computer have eyeballs? <laughs> no. So, it's guessing what optical kerning is. Oh, that's better, Mr. Computer. Thank you. However, you have eyeballs. Now, I'm going to make this metrics again. There is a difference. Do you see it? The big Mac truck can't go driving through there as easily as it could before. Things, certain letter pairs are tightened. Certain letter pairs are loosened. But that does look better. Now, I'm going to delete that one. But because the G is a very round object and it's sitting next to something that's highly vertical, um, I need to possibly adjust this some more. Because I have eyeballs and the computer doesn't, I can see that. So I'm going to take this down in thousandths of an M. I'm just going to use a little arrow down tool, the arrow down. I'm going to click on that until I think it looks comfortably correct. Ah, <sighs> much better. I might even go between the K and the I and do a little bit of adjusting there as well. Now, when you, it's kind of like playing dominoes. When you adjust the spacing between two letter pairs, it affects the overall appearance of the rest. Now, this is a fairly tightly kerned word. What I had before, and, and people will argue about kerning all day long. Oh, I like the other one better than that. And that's fine. Kerning is kind of like, Beauty is in the eye of the beholder. This looks like a designer is working with it. This looks like a non-designer is working with it. This is why I get paid the big bucks. One of the many reasons. <laughs> it's because I know about kerning and how to do it properly and how to make things look like they just flow effortlessly space-wise from one thing to another. They balance well. Okay? All right. Now, did I just plunk this right next to this? And then plank, take this C and go whoop, and plunk it right here. No, but close. I'm always making adjustments. Like, even though that may match, match this, I'm going to take this down in size just a smidge. Optically, it's, at this point, it's all about optical adjustments. Like, okay, that looks better. But my lord, look at the fat C here. Oh, ugh. that is way too heavy for my taste. It's about creating a sense of unity. Now, this is a tricky thing here because this typeface does not come in anything lighter. It comes in regular, bold, and bold italic, and that's it. Uh, it's not even giving me that. So not even this full font is loaded, but I do know that this does not come in, in a, a light version. So I'm going to fake it. I do not suggest you just go and put outlines on your type. That is a highly ineffective way to manage typography uh, like, for instance, I'm going to outline this type. I'm going to go to my swatches panel, 
And oh, look, I'm gonna click on the T. See that tiny little T? I'm gonna click on that. That's really, a lot of people don't know. Oh, there's a box to fill my box with a color. Oh, let's fill the box with a color. Oops, no, that's not what I wanted. It's not about the box, none. Let's make it about the tea. Oh, oh, look, the tea is blue. Okay, this doesn't make any sense to have my tea blue, but I'm just telling you, you have a type and a formatting for type and formatting for the box that the type holds. So make sure you know what you're on. So that needs to be black. Then there's this little tiny little guy right here. Don't click on the arrow. This is a flip. That flips. That flips the fill and the stroke. Oh, the fill was black and the stroke was none. Now it flips, so the stroke is black and the fill is none. That's not what I wanted either. That's, that, that little flipper, that's what he does. It flips the fill color to the stroke color. So what I want to do is get the stroke color. That little box, see how he's, oh, now he, it's hard to tell, but you can see it over here. See how he's in front? Now, if I, if I have the type color, he'll be in the front. So if you need a bigger picture, look over here. In fact, maybe even you go, oh, I can't see very well. Let me put this right over here so I can see the two. Get the stroke color to come up. We want to stroke this, in this case, with paper, paper color, which in this case will be white. Okay? Now, it didn't do anything. I know. So let's bring up the stroke panel. Let's make this really thick. Oh, I'm making a real thick stroke. Color. Nothing's happening. <sighs> well, can I click on this? What's that do? What's this do? What's that? Nothing's happening. Ugh. This is frustrating. Okay, so let's talk about this. Uh, strokes tend to go on the outsides of letters. Uh, well, no, in InDesign it can do anything, but let's, let's, uh, let me make sure I got the right thing going on. Stroke of paper. Okay. Uh, let's maybe have, we may have to convert the type to outlines to get this to stroke properly because nothing, it's not taking away. What my hope was is I could have it stroke from, say, the center and it would start taking some of this away. Oh, there we go. It's doing it right now. Sorry. Why is it doing it right? Okay, so let's stop and slow down and let's see why it's doing it right. This is selected. It's still type. I didn't have to convert it to outlines. The weight of the stroke needs to be increased. Okay, and you see how it starts to bite away at that shape. Now, luckily, I'm using a C. If I had another shape, uh, it might not do so well. And I'll show you maybe on the lowercase n. Here we have the align stroke to the outside, the center, or the inside. Okay, so with the outside might have been selected, that's why nothing was happening. But if I have it aligned to the inside of the, and this is the inside of the outside shape of the line, or of the C. So it's going into the C. I can make this uh, C appear if it's as, small, as if it's smaller. Now, this does not always work. <coughs> for all letters. I'm going to take King and I'm going to copy it and I'm going to apply a paper colored or white stroke to that with a black fill. Oh, I've got the box select. Don't you hate when that happens? Always this happens. Oh no, the box needs to be none and so does its stroke. The type needs to be black. Oh no, white stroke. And it the type needs to be filled with black. Okay, fill of type is black. That gets really confusing, folks. Just being able to deal with fills and strokes can be really confusing. But I am now stroking the text with paper or white, and I'm going to make it from the uh, inside, and I'm going to increase this, and you'll start to see this does not look good, especially here. Let me circle this. Right here. Right here right here. It starts to look pretty, and right even in here, it's starting to disappear. This That was actually connected. Those areas do not look good. I was just lucky that I had the letter C. Because you can see it starts to gobble away at the letter at the really, at the important areas of where uh, vertical strokes meet circular strokes. So, and where other strokes meet other strokes, like even here. So this trick is, all, is reserved for only certain kinds of letters, certain uh, geometric shapes. It doesn't work on everything. So putting white stroke on something to get this to happen is not the best situation always. Sometimes I have to redraw the letter. Okay. I was just lucky. All right, I'm going to hide that for just a second.
object type. There we go. <clears throat> now, you're wondering about the tittle of the eye. I know you are. How did you kill the old tittle of the eye and put a new tittle of the eye in? Um, so the dot of the eye is known as the tittle. I actually did convert this type to outlines. Now, what I do before I do that, because I hate retyping something over again. In fact, let me zoom out, get this kind of in position where it looks nice. Um, I'm going to copy and paste this piece of typography because I don't want to have to typeset it again later. I'll just alt drag it out to the pasteboard. Okay, if I hit the W2 key, W key, you'll see it's out there. Uh, anytime I convert something to outlines, I copy it as it's still a typeface or font. I still copy that font so it's, it retains um, editability. Because what if you spell the word wrong? <laughs> so I, I put that out there, and sometimes I turn him off or hide him, but he's not going to print anyway. And I come back to this guy here. I click on it with the black arrow tool, known as the selection tool. And like, let me see if they change this. Yeah, you can be either in the type tool, you can be in the selection tool. Used to, you couldn't be in the type tool. If you're in an older version, sometimes you have to do this with the uh, black arrow tool. But you go to type and create outlines. And if you do a lot of this, it's shift command O on a PC, shift control O. And what it does is, it doesn't look like it, but it converted these to shapes. It's no longer editable type. So if you've misspelled something, you can't go and highlight it and type in a new letter. Now, how do I know it's converted outlines? Because I did it. And two, when I turn on, when I click on the white arrow tool, assuming this is selected, you can see all the anchor points. This is no longer considered a font. This is considered shapes. Okay? As far as a computer is concerned. So let's say you were doing something funky and you wanted this K to be really elongated. I can click and drag over those anchor points and start moving that up. You're going, what's this thing over here? Uh, it's probably some sort of directional point. It's, it's not going to show up. You know, if I wanted this one to come down, I do the same thing. Now this looks dumb, I know. If I wanted my G to kind of hang out and down, I'm going to start doing this. We've kind of done this before. So that's a little bit of a review. Now what I really want to do is get rid of the tittle of the eye, but before I do anything foolish, I will copy one of these guys. Get the direct selection tool, click on it, make sure it's in a layer that's not locked. He's okay, okay. Sometimes I have to move something to a different uh, Layer like the C might get in the way. Let me command zero and see what's going on. Do, 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 do. I'm like, I can't grab it. Oh, that drives me nuts. Look at that. I got it now. Oh, how did you do that? How did you get behind that C? You guys ever clicked on something? You're like, I want that back there and it won't let me get it. Oh, frustrating. If you're on a Mac, hold down the command key, keep clicking, and you'll get to the next layer. If you're on a PC, keep clicking and hold down the control key, you'll get down to the next layer. That drives people batty. Oh, he's on a different layer completely, that's why. Or I can go, oh, okay, let me drag burner layer up to the top. That'll solve all that problem. Okay, they're in two different layers. I forgot. So I'm going to grab the white arrow tool, click on this object, make sure all of the anchor points are solid. They are not. If I click dead center, they'll turn solid. I'm going to copy that, Command-C. I'm going to zoom out then zoom in to this and I'm going to paste that. I'm going to move this into the position that it needs to move in and I'm going to resize it holding down shift and command. Resize it, it was a little big. I'm going to go to object and lock it. I don't want anything happening to it. Now zoom out. I'm going to get my white arrow tool, the direct selection tool, and I'm going to click and drag over just the tittle of the eye. Now, the rest of the word is selected, but not really, not the anchor points at least, but the anchor points of the tittle of the eye are selected. I hit the delete key. The tittle of the eye that originally was there is gone. Now, if I accidentally hit the delete key again, I'll get rid of the whole word. So that's just a one, I hit the delete key one time. And now, I'm ready to print this 
for a critique. Now, I will tell you guys, I want to save you guys a little money on the um, printing of the drafts for critique. I want to check announcement. I think I have you guys doing half size, but let me see. It doesn't say. Digital, it just says digital first drafts. To save you guys money, let's not print the 10 by 10 because that means you have to print to 11 by 17. That costs you more money. So we can do a half size draft or actually let's not even have to think about the mathematics on that. Well, it's only 50%. But when you guys go to print this, now I'm going to print here because it's easier for me to than having to run down to the to the hallway. But these this is black and white. I should probably point to the black and white printer. It's cheaper. But let's say your yours is in color. Uh, then you can just print right here to this room. Now I'm going to go to File and Print. You want crop marks turned on on this so you know where to cut it out. And um, hmm, I don't know what they're naming things, but I think they're naming this one. They renamed the printer since they moved it. It's just called 328, which is our classroom we're in. 328XE7800. So I know in previous notes you had 7800 printer A and 7800 printer B. Well, we're we're we you know we're the school of change here. So uh, this guy is now the 328XE, which is Xerox 7800. You can still print to the black and white printer. The black and white printer is now called. Uh, it's in 341. That's the open lab down there. It's called the HP 8150. Okay, that's the black and white printer. But again, for now I'm going to print to the 7800. And to save us money, we're going to print to 8.5 by 11. But you can see clearly that this preview is larger than 8.5 by 11. This P with the blue uh, square. <clears throat> so under setup, here's what I'm going to have you guys do. <clears throat> we could type in 50%, but what the heck. Let's just tell it to scale to fit. Um, the other thing we want to do is turn the crop marks on. You need to know where to cut it out. Now, when scale to fit is selected, it'll automatically center it. Okay. That was under setup. There's general and setup. This was under setup, and I chose scale to fit. Crop marks are the little tick marks that tell us where to cut things out. Wait, where's that? Marks and bleed. That's the next one. So we go to marks and bleeds for the crop marks. That tells us where to cut things out. And this preview, will, this little guy will shrink a little bit to accommodate the crop marks. Oh, look, it shrunk a little bit, and there's little crop marks in there. Now, when you cut things out, we should not see the crop marks at all. So you're going to – I do think I need to show an example of how to cut something with crop marks because I, I have seen on the past projects you've turned in that have crop marks. I think there is some confusion there. So I'm actually going to do a cutting demonstration today to make sure we're all literally on the same page. Okay, so crop marks there. Uh, if you have bleeds, we've talked about bleeds in another class. Um, this does not have bleeds, but some of you guys have like, whoever has settle, was that Emily? Like Emily's going to have the word settle and her stuff's going to bleed off the page. So she wants to make sure uh, she, she uh, sets the bleed in her document. You remember how to do that, Emily? I'm going to cancel this because I need to cover that. File, when you create the document, you do it, or if the document's already created, you can go back. File, document setup, and you go to bleed and slug, and you give it an eighth of an inch bleed, which is equal to P9, not nine pi, not nine picas, it's nine points, P9. And um, it'll, they should, as soon as I hit the tab, all be P9. Uh, if you don't understand the P9 business, uh, then it's 0.125 IN. That will automatically convert to P9. Those are the same measure. We want an eighth of an inch bleed. Now you'll see, if I hit the W key, you'll see that there's a red line around the edge of my document. So that tells me where the bleed is. Okay, so I didn't have bleed, so I didn't bother setting it. But some of you guys need to set your bleed. Now when I go to file and print, sorry, I had to back off there for a second. I choose, for me, I'm going to choose a color printer. For just some of you guys, it'll be black and white printer. I go to setup, tell it to scale to fit. This is for drafts. Don't do this on the finished stuff. You don't want to scale to fit. Uh, marks and bleeds, I turn the crop marks on. And it's going to automatically use the document bleed setting at, and you'll see it says P9 in here. It said zero before at P9 because I just went and set that. 
And when I hit print, it should print to 8 and half by 11 because that's what was selected. And I'm hearing the printer right now kicking up. Um, and it'll print this, and then I can cut them out using the crop marks. Okay, I'm going to do a couple of other demonstrations, but I'm going to, uh, uh, we're going to take a break. I'm going to save this video and have it doing its thing and try to upload it. And then I'll probably have some more demonstration um, because that's, I didn't cover everything that you can do with the, with the Illustrator because I know there's some special things with typography in Illustrator that we'll have to do for things like your swim. Yeah. Somebody has swim that make, maybe looks like a fish. Um, I'll have to kind of, maybe during break, uh, bring out your, your, illu your illustrated, your, your hand rendered drafts so I can remember what it is we're do you know, each of you are doing and maybe and I'll pull up demonstrations based off of what I'm seeing that you guys want to do. I know Dusty was also another one that was kind of wacky. Um, so I'm going to save my uh, recording and we'll come back from a break and I'll cut the, do the crop mark thing so you all understand that. Um, what do you think, about 15 minutes break? Sure. All right, I'll see you in 15 minutes.